Hello, thank you for coming out tonight. My name's Wendy Hisco. I'm the director here at Brownell Library. The iconic Pulitzer Prize Gold Medal is awarded each year to the American news organization that wins the public service category. It is never awarded to an individual. However, through the years, the medal has come to symbolize the entire, entire Pulitzer program. In 1918, a year after the prizes began, the medal was designed by the sculptor Daniel Chester French and his associate, Henry Augustus Lukeman. This is a picture of the, if you, you want to just pass it around if you want to see it up close. French later gained fame for his seated Lincoln at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington. One side of the medal displays the profile of Benjamin Franklin, apparently based on the bust by French sculptor Jean-Antoine Houdin. Decorating the other side is a husky, bare-chested printer at work, his shirt draped across the end of the press. Surrounding the printer are the words for a disinterested and meritorious public service rendered by an American newspaper during the year. The name of the winning news organization is inscribed on the Franklin side of the medal. The year of the award is memorialized on the other side. The medal is about two and three quarters inches in diameter and a quarter inch in thick. It is not solid gold. It is silver with a 24 karat gold plate presented to the winning newspaper in an elegant cherry wood box with brass hardware. I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. Roy Harris has been a journalist for some of the na nation's most respected news publications for four decades. From 1971 to 1994, he served as a reporter and editor for the Wall Street Journal, including six years as a deputy chief of its 14-member Los Angeles Bureau. His next 13 years were spent as a senior editor for the Economist Group's Boston-based CFO magazine. Through his news career, Roy has covered major stories such as the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago, the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles, and helped coordinate coverage of the 1992 race rioting that followed the police beating of Rodney King and the devastating 1994 Northridge earthquake. Retaining his interest in the newspaper business, he researched and wrote Pulitzer's Gold, a book that has earned him praise for, from Bob Woodward as a master historian of the Pulitzer Prize, which is also available for sale tonight at the Phoenix Books table outside. So I'd like to introduce now Roy Harris. Thank you, Wendy. I could tell you a lot about that medal and Daniel Chester French. I heard some oohs and ahs back there. You know about him? discovered him even before I started work on this book. It's his museum down in Stockbridge. If you're ever down there for Tanglewood or something, there's the Norman Rockwell Museum and right nearby is the Chester Wood, which is his museum where you can see how he designed the, uh, the Lincoln statue. Fascinating, fascinating guy. And he's, he's all over New York City too. He did so much of the statuary everywhere. Okay. Thank you all for being here tonight, and thank you to Brownell Library. Um, I'm really thrilled that uh, I was invited to come up here um, from Boston. Um, the uh, Vermont Humanities Council, as you've heard, has gotten deeply involved with this whole idea of honoring the centennial of the Pulitzer Prizes this year. And my publisher, Columbia University Press, uh, decided to come out with a brand new edition that's I thoroughly, thoroughly rewrote and updated for this year. So uh, I'm really excited to be kind of tagging on to all the glory of the Pulitzer Prizes this year. Um, so, you know, my topic tonight is really great journalism. Um, and more particularly, it's the fabulous reporting that has been honored with this Pulitzer Prize for public service over the years. So, as you've heard, we share a special distinction tonight. The, Centennial of the Pulitzer Prize uh, has just begun, and this Campfires Initiative that, that Wendy was talking about um, has really just gotten started. So this is one of the first programs of this national program that's running all year uh, to honor the Centennial of the Pulitzer Prizes, and uh, uh, it's really thrilling for me to be involved with it. It, it started in, uh, in Washington uh, two weeks ago uh, at the museum and the Washington Post, which had just moved to its brand new headquarters, 
which is just, uh, was just absolutely wonderful. They're dealing with a mouse problem in there, but when they got that solved, the Washington Post uh, uh, new headquarters is, is gonna be fabulous and the home to, to much more great, great journalism. Uh, but this is just really right at the beginning, so it's, it's quite exciting. Um, so this is really a huge year for the Pulitzers. Um, and as you know, it honors not just journalism, but arts and literature as well. Um, when the winners uh, uh, are announced, uh, this will be a special year for it, they'll be announced April 18th, coming up. Um, and it's a press conference that's far less glamorous, really, than any of those other media ceremonies that we've, that we've come to know. Uh, the Oscars, which we all probably tuned into at least part of it, um, getting ready for Super Tuesday, right? Um, it's a very low-key presentation, and, and uh, I'll, I'll be there in, in New York for that. They do that at uh, the, the so-called world room of, the, of Columbia University uh, Journalism School, and it's very, very quiet. Um, but this year, I think there'll be a lot more commotion about it. Uh, I hope also because of the great journalism that's honored, but also because it's the, it's the 100th anniversary. So my focus tonight is going to be on one category of the journalism Pulitzer Prizes. We can talk a little bit more about other categories and even go into uh, the non-journalism prizes that we all know about best fiction, best music, things like that. But um, as you'll hear, the, the, the really the heart of the Pulitzer Prizes from their very beginning was the Public Service Award, and you'll hear a little bit about why that is. Um, it's the subject of my book, which is called Pulitzer's Gold, A Century of Public Service Journalism, and it's just out in that new edition I told you about from Columbia University Press. Now, the book examines closely the work that won each year, so it's full of backstories about how stories were written, how teams of journalists got together and worked with their editors to find the story that was really going to make a difference in their, in their community. Um, I hope by the end of the night you'll agree that the story of the Pulitzer Prizes themselves and its journalism jewel, the Public Service Gold Medal, is in itself uh, a great story. So journalists sometimes like to say that all journalism is local journalism. Because even when you're working on a big national story, like this year's elections, for example, the reporting comes down to Vermont, <laughs> the people in Vermont, the people in Georgia, you know, uh, it comes down to Super Tuesdays and things like that that are, that are really very, very local. Um, but every great story, no matter how national or international, has to start somewhere. And the Pulitzer Prizes started in New England. Um, this is something I kind of happened on myself, because I don't think a lot of people knew about this. In the case of the Pulitzers, um, Bar Harbor was where they were first conceived. Um, it was at uh, Joseph Pulitzer's estate called Chatwald, which is pictured up there. It burned down in the 40s, unfortunately. I went to see the lot where it had been, where it was now leveled. It's quite a beautiful site, but no building like that anymore. Um, and he came up with the idea in 1902. The aging Joseph Pulitzer had this brainstorm about creating a system of annual awards that would honor the best of American arts and letters along with journalism. Now, as you may remember from your American history classes, uh, Pulitzer himself had been embroiled in uh, a lot of controversy in his lifetime, especially in the 1890s. For years, he was involved with that period called yellow journalism, in which his own newspaper, the New York World, fought uh, a rather unsavory and sensational battle, especially with uh, William Randolph Hearst, for uh, when papers cost a penny. He was fighting to get the pennies of New Yorkers by trying to out-sensationalize each other. That's the whole thing that got into the Spanish-American War, remember the Maine, all of that was involved with yellow journalism. Um, what I found in my research when I began to look at the Pulitzer Prizes to, for this book was that in Joseph Pulitzer's later years, he really wished to change his ways. He was a, quite a principled man for most of his life until the 1890s. 
And as he began to get older, you know, turning to the ripe old age of about 60 um, in 1902, um, it occurred to him that he really needed to change his legacy somehow. And he began to plot out how to do that. So um, in 1902, with Alfred Nobel's global prizes only a year old, they started in, in 1901, and they were fresh in Pulitzer's mind, Pulitzer privately outlined a plan to do two things. One was to create a school of journalism. There were no schools of journalism. And he had this idea of creating it. He, he worked with a couple of different uh, institutions and finally decided it would be at Columbia University. Um, and this would be the first training of news professionals. He envisioned journalism as being a, a, a profession that really needed to have training just the way doctors and lawyers were trained. The second thing was to establish a series of awards uh, that would give journalists great examples of public service to be emulated. There were none at that time. There were no, uh, there were no annual awards really of any kind. When you, when you think about it, all of, all of the, the great annual awards you hear every year started later. The, anybody remember how old the Oscars are? This was 88. This was the 88th year. So, you know, Pulitzer's being 100 were, were quite well established by the time the, the Oscars uh, came in. Of course, they first had to come up with movies, but that, that came in between. As for the Pulitzer Prizes, uh, the brilliant stroke that, uh, that Joseph Pulitzer had, knowing the reputation that journalism had acquired in large part because of his, uh, his doing in New York, um, he decided that what needed to be done for journalism was to take this prize and to associate it with the best of American literature as well as journalism. Literature at the time, American literature, was becoming known as, as, uh, as, as really terrific, and uh, it was kind of in the early years of the great writers being, being recognized. And um, journalism, being somewhat reviled in his day, in that day, his hope was that by associating news awards with the awards being given to great writers, poets, uh, uh, that it would elevate journalism by association. That if, when, when great stories were recognized at the same time that a Robert Frost, for example, was cited for poetry, that would make everybody feel a little bit better about journalism. Well, it happened, but it took a while. The creation of Columbia's Journalism School and his Pulitzer Prizes um, were established in his will, which he wrote in 1904. He died in 1911, and so it took a few years for Columbia University to, uh, to establish its School of Journalism. By the time it had done that, it was the second School of Journalism. University of Missouri had beat them to the punch by a year or two. Um, so they established the, the uh, Columbia University established the School of Journalism, and then the School of Journalism began to administer the Pulitzer Prizes, and they were uh, awarded the first year in 1917 uh, for work that was done the prior year in 1916. And it was definitely a while before the Pulitzer Prizes began to be appreciated in the journalism world and in the world of news consumers. Well, how well did Pulitzer do in establishing models of great journalism? One measure is the work of the Boston Globe, which, as you know, was honored again uh, this past week uh, with uh, the Spotlight movie winning the, uh, the Oscar for Best Picture. Caught everybody, including all the reporters that I got to know at the Boston Globe by surprise. They were sure The Revenant was going to win it, but um, didn't. Spotlight won the prize for, uh, for Best Picture. May I just ask a show of hands, how many people have seen Spotlight? Ah, it's a good involved community. Okay, glad to hear it. And I hope you, you found it was valuable. I, you, I occasionally do run into people who are upset by it, but uh, I think it was done in a way that, uh, that really helped people appreciate the way teams of journalists work. Um, Later on, we'll talk a little bit about the Globe story, which dates back to 2001 and 2002. Um, it won the Public Service Pulitzer Prize in 2003, and 
the movie Spotlight run, uh, won the, uh, began, they began work on that years later. Actually, I'd already written my chapter for the book. It was the backbone of the book in many ways because I was living in Boston at the time those stories came out and was very moved by it and wanted to find out about that from, from all of the journalists. So um, I, the book had already come out when the producers were able to get somebody to, to uh, take the idea uh, of a movie to uh, Open Road was the name of the production company, and they, they really had to battle to get it made. I'm really glad they did. The truth is, of course, that the media, print, broadcast, and online, where increasing numbers of us are getting our information, uh, is embroiled not in talking about the best of all journalism, but the worst of all journalism. Media criticism seems to be extremely intense right now. Uh, a lot of it involved with the election, but it doesn't, you don't need an election to find uh, journalism to criticize. Um, I'm a journalism critic myself. Occasionally over the years I've been involved with that uh, Emily Rooney program. If you get it up here, you know, Beat the Press, I've been on that program. So I have, I have my chance from time to time to, uh, to criticize in a negative way what's going on in the media. But I believe that excellence deserves attention too. And so my book and our subject tonight is an attempt to give equal time to the service that great journalism provides. It's also really good, I think, to be able to teach journalism students um, and young journalists in general about the best that their chosen profession is capable of. And I'll tell you, as someone who went through journalism school and who's taught journalism, it is amazing how little there is out there by way of examples of great reporting, especially how teams work, to give to journalism students so that they, got, they get a sense of what is possible at the very highest level. Um, so I give thanks to Spotlight, the movie, and the movie All the President's Men for kind of popularizing uh, this great team journalism in a way that, that may get more people interested in, in doing journalism the right way. Um, and it's also a good chance to probably brought a few more people out here tonight to think about, you know, that the Spotlight is uh, uh, sort of a, what we'd call in the news business, a news peg for discussing uh, public service journalism. Okay, well I'm gonna start with a little bit of history since this is the 100th anniversary. Uh, the method for selecting journalism uh, Pulitzer winners has changed over the years. For the earliest awards, which started being handed out in 1917, for the work done the previous year, professors at that brand new Columbia Journalism School served as the jurors, and a board made up of top newspaper editors from around the country made the final decision based on principles of public service that Joseph Pulitzer had outlined in his good years. After a while, though, a jury system was set up to bring in news professionals from around the country, including a number of people who had uh, earned credits as Pulitzer winners themselves, to privately confer about the best that the news business had produced during the prior year. And then there's a Pulitzer board of now 18 people uh, that, uh, um, that would look at the nominations that came in through those uh, those professionals who came from around the country and decide what would win in each of the categories. Pulitzer's had a very rough start. Um, there were only three journalism prizes when they were first handed out. Public service, um, editorial writing, and reporting. Just one category for reporting. There are now 14 categories, um, which in a way isn't that much inflation when you think about it. You know, there could be, you could think of all the different ways to give prizes, and they've made the decision not to break it down into small news organizations, medium size. There's one public service award, except when they split it between two people. There's, there's one prize that goes out for the best public service, no matter the size of the organization. In 1917, for whatever reason, the Pulitzer board couldn't come up with a winner in its main category, occasionally in public service. It occasionally will leave a, a category blank, but for that to be the case in the first year suggests to you that, uh, well, it could suggest to you that there was no great public service, but it suggests to me as I, as I researched all of this that uh, the Pulitzer Prize is just really 
you know, it's hard to think of it now because it's such a big deal, but it was such a new thing, people really didn't know what an annual award was, what a Pulitzer Prize might be. Pulitzer also, his, his image was, was, uh, was tarnished. So uh, it took a while for the Pulitzers to, to prove themselves, I think. Um, it was 1918 that the first gold medal was award, awarded. It's the one the newspaper up there. Actually, it looks a lot like on a very big news day at the New York Times today. Um, New York Times won in 1918 for uh, its coverage of World War I. A fascinating case because uh, you, know, you think of the impact of technology on the media today. The New York Times winning the first Pulitzer Prize was a technology prize in many ways because they were the first of the major news organizations to use the transatlantic cable. And they were able to beat all the other competitors in getting stories from the front about what was going on. And their philosophy, uh, not unlike in a way the, the way the New York Times views things today, is that readers of the New York Times deserve, deserve the full story. So they would print entire texts of um, di diplomatic uh, documents that they, that they were able to get. In this case, you see up there, they have the entire text of President Wilson's speech calling for a war declaration. Um, that was the way the New York Times did things then. I think they've cut back a little bit. Maybe they'd let you read all of that online now. Um, so that was the first prize, and it was 1918, and that's when the first, uh, um, the, first, uh, the first gold medal was handed out that Daniel Chester French had designed. So when it comes to looking at the Pulitzer's early history, uh, the next story that I like to talk about uh, was from 1920, and it in many ways is one of my favorite stories because I learned an awful lot about this in the process that completely astounded me. And I think it's one of the most important stories for the Pulitzer Prizes because it did set a model for uh, newspapers uh, around the country to, to, uh, to see what a news organization, what editors and reporters are, are capable of. Um, the old Boston Post discovered that a supposed local financial wizard, um, Charles Ponzi, was actually a fraud artist with a long criminal history who'd served prison terms in Georgia and in Canada, in Canada under a different name. And he had somehow gained this fantastic reputation in, uh, in Boston by uh, promising to double people's money in 90 days. And as you know, what you've heard about pyramid schemes, that the fact that the Ponzi scheme is, is still discussed today is kind of a household term. Just in a very rough way, as you probably know, uh, the, the early investors, their money is used to pay off uh, the, 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 the very first investors so that the first people really do get their money doubled. And that is used for publicity to bring in more money. But in Charles Ponzi's case, the, uh, the basic investment scheme was a total sham. Uh, he told a great story about what, uh, uh, what the investment was. But, uh, but there was not any fundamental money-making proposition under what he was doing. So he had been celebrated as a true hero, including on many of the front pages of Boston newspapers. Um, and his investments, uh, in fact, were doubling money for the first few people. But once the public began to see, when the Boston Post sent reporters to Canada to track down a fellow named Ponzi, P-O-N-S-I, who had served a prison term for fraud and found that he had also served prison time in, in Georgia, they were also able to track down the, the, uh, the, the false notion about his investment. And uh, it took a while because people really believed that he was, he was legit, but after a few weeks of these stories exposing, uh, exposing him, uh, he was in fact arrested and served a long prison term. Um, America, though, might not have paid much attention to that story, and especially the role of the newspaper in exposing this fraud, had it not been for the Pulitzer Prizes. So in those very early years, they began to establish themselves uh, by publicizing work that had been done in one local community. 
So it was in the 20s that the American press, I think, began to establish those standards for the kind of public service journalism that we've come to expect from the media at the very highest level. Uh, with literary stars at the time in the 20s and 30s, like Thornton Wilder, Willa Cather, Edna Ferber, Robert Frost, as I mentioned, you know, uh, um, they were winning Pulitzer Prizes too. And indeed, Joseph Pulitzer's plan began to take effect. And the journalism that was winning prizes, along with these great, uh, these great literary figures, um, did in fact uh, elevate the profession more newspapers began to do that kind of investigative reporting. And I think it helped citizens see that the press could, in fact, be a, a great force for, for good. As it turned out, by recognizing the great journalism of the day, the Pulitzer Prizes, I think, managed to help create a historical record of America, um, which is something I try to reflect in the book. As one of the discoveries, when I started writing the book, I was thinking a lot of helping journalists see from great examples. But what I found was that by looking at these, these stories over the years and how they developed, you not only learned about how journalism had evolved, but you began to learn about these, the, the nature of America, the great change. When you think about it, obviously World War I, we started with the first prize, clearly one of the most important stories of the 20th century, early 20th century for America. But you look at Charles Ponzi, could you think of a better example of the 20s? You know, coming back after the end of World War I, anything is possible, everyone could get rich quick. It was the American decade. Uh, the perfect story, really, to, exp to express the Roaring Twenties. Later in the, um, in the 20s, we began to have, you know, along with the collapse developing for 1929, you began to have uh, mob activity, uh, the, what was going to eventually take over in, in the 30s, in the Depression. Um, another story that comes to mind, in, in, during the Depression, a small newspaper in North Dakota did a series of stories about what the Dust Bowl really meant. Um, it was an amazing story for me to read. It's sort of been lost to history, because even the Pulitzer Prizes didn't promote these very much. And um, uh, it was uh, the, the the paper picked up all this information about how, for example, Native Americans had viewed tilling the soil in a way that was totally different from the way uh, the, the immigrants and Americans handled the, the soil in the Midwest. And that, the, and that actually the Great Depression, uh, not the Great Depression, but the Dust Bowl grew in a, lo to, in, in a major way from the way the, the land had been raped. People really didn't recognize what they were doing to the, sto to the soil and to, to the land with their farming methods. And the Dust Bowl, to a great extent, was, was a result of that. Um, the newspaper taught local farmers how to treat the land differently. Uh, and those that stayed uh, were, were able to, to make uh, more of a life. Um, again, just kind of following that theme that these stories really traced how the U.S. was developing. Um, in 1941, my hometown newspaper, I'm from St. Louis, the hometown newspaper is the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, it, it won the Public Service Pulitzer Prize for a remarkable series of stories where it uh, analyzed why the air in St. Louis was so filthy. And it, uh, it, uh, it did a lot of research. In the 40s, it wasn't quite as easy to do this research, found that high sulfur coal, very cheap coal, that St. Louis was bringing in from across the Mississippi River in southern Illinois, was being used by industry. Unthinkingly, it was the cheapest way to go. And the air was getting totally clogged with smoke. It was happening in cities all around the world. But St. Louis, the Post-Dispatch began to look at their specific case. Um, and uh, interesting little uh, uh, feature of that was that uh, Joseph Pulitzer owned the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Joseph Pulitzer's son, and then his grandson. It was the part of the Pulitzer Publishing Company. They owned the World in New York and the Post-Dispatch in St. Louis. And whenever the publisher would fly back from pristine Bar Harbor into St. Louis, he would see the difference in the air. And it was actually the publisher of the paper who decided to press for the newspaper 
to look at what it was that was making the air so filthy. At, the, at that time, the population of St. Louis had begun to decline, which was just unheard of, that a, the, the gateway to the West would be declining public, uh, a population. So the newspaper did this research, and they were able to show that over a period, well, the amazing thing was they got companies to agree that the air was so filthy that it was worth it for the companies to pay for, higher, for lower sulfur, more expensive coal. And the companies themselves cut back on their use of that high sulfur coal, and that's what began to clear the air. It was truly amazing. Um, other cities picked up on that model. I found indication of that last time I was in Los Angeles. The Los Angeles Times had a clipping in their, in their trophy room of uh, Raymond R. Tucker, who was, became the mayor of St. Louis for four terms. But he was a, 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 um, uh, an engineer and a scientist who began to go to cities all around the world to tell them about the impact of high sulfur coal. And cities as far away as London actually made changes uh, London's still pretty dirty, but it's much better now than it was before. So it really kind of swept the globe. Um, just a little bit about St. Louis. It's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, that, was that, that prize in 1941 was one of four public service Pulitzer Prizes uh, that my father was involved in. He was a reporter for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And as you probably will understand, that's one of the reasons why I was particularly interested in this subject. Um, when I began to learn about it, in a way, it was to find out about the kind of work that my dad had done over the years. So there was a very personal element to that. So I'm going to jump around a little bit. Not surprisingly, uh, the movement in the press to study these problems and examine, it, examine how to make things better uh, got the press deeply involved uh, with many controversies, political controversies. Um, early winners, um, as early as 1922, uh, were exposing the Ku Klux Klan. There's a classic story uh, that won for the New York world, in fact, in the, in the early years, which ran a big front page story with all the Ku Klux Klan's secrets. And one of the things it did was to not only unmask who was under the hoods, but also to talk about the money raising scheme that the Ku Klux Klan was involved in. Um, you know, people were still thinking of uh, uh, birth of birth of a nation. You know, where the Ku Klux Klan in the early movies was, was actually presented as being heroic, and uh, what uh, what the newspapers were able to disclose was that the Ku Klux Klan was was really scummy organization in all sorts of ways, not just for what they stood for, but the fact that it was uh, it was financially built on uh, a system to just make people rich, make the, fee the Grand Dragons and Wizards Rich. Um, if there are any KKK members out there, you know, I'll talk to you later about this. I don't think they're probably are here. Um, so let's see, that was 1922. They're actually, the first, first few years, there were several cases of local newspapers that took on their own local Ku Klux Klan. The New York World didn't have as much of a, an issue. That was a national story for them. But the Memphis Commercial Appeal won in the 20s. Uh, very courageous for a newspaper in Memphis to be unmasking local leaders as members of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so in 1958, the Arkansas Gazette and its editor, Harry Ashmore, that's the slide up there, won for its even-handed way uh, in covering Little Rock's school de dis uh, desegregation order that grew from the Supreme Court's uh, Brown versus Board of Education decision. His paper noted that the eyes of America were on the city of Little Rock and challenged the governor's opposition to the law of the land. Um, the Pulitzer organization especially liked the courageous nature of that journalism, just as Memphis had been cited. Um, the paper was, in a way, was looking out for a racial minority. And now if you read the stories, uh, they read like the 50s. So, you know, the, the, the stories are full of what you would hear in Little Rock, but they were standing up for, uh, for the law of the land and saying that the eyes of the world were on Little Rock and that, uh, th that the people had to, to obey the law. Um, the Gazette, incidentally, paid a price for that courage and circulation 
in Arkansas went way down among those who didn't like the paper's position um, and it eventually was bought out by a rival paper, no longer exists. So we're skipping over some great old stories, of course, you know, that's, time is going to fly here. Uh, I won't say much about either the New York Times analysis of the secret Pentagon Papers, which won in 1972, uh, uh, but um, it was one case of the Pulitzer organization having to deal with controversy. Uh, the documents, uh, the Nixon administration had challenged the Times in court when the newspaper revealed how several presidential administrations had lied to Americans about the Vietnam War. A description of deceit, when you think about it, that was in the government's own language. It was written by the Pentagon, it was our story, but it had been kept from the people. Um, that's not the way a lot of people saw it, however. Uh, others saw it as documents that had been stolen and, uh, and, and faulted the New York Times and other newspapers that, that later ran them. Um, it took the Supreme Court to establish that press freedom could not be abridged by the government. It's that other amendment, the First Amendment. So you've noticed that I've been surging ahead, uh, kind of skipped the 60s, for example, uh, when a lot of great journalism was honored. Uh, it's all in the book, I guarantee you. Um, 60s was also when I got my start in the business. You heard that I covered the Democratic National Convention. That's true. I was just out of college. I was working for the LA Times, and they assigned me to cover the Democratic National Convention as one of a team of people, because they figured I really couldn't do any damage. You know, I was just out of school. So they gave me a job that they figured wouldn't be all that difficult. They would have me cover the street scene. It's outside the Democratic National Convention. None of the big reporters wanted to be on the street. They wanted to get the big story, which as you all remember was Hubert Humphrey's acceptance speech. No, actually I ended up being right in the middle of it. And by the time it was over, all of the big reporters wanted to come out to the street to take their chances with the, uh, with the Chicago police. But it was a great way for me to kind of break in to the business. So 1972 and 1973 though, uh, with the Pentagon Papers and Watergate, we have what I consider to be one of the greatest two-year periods of, of American journalism, so far anyway. Um, interestingly though, from the standpoint of the book, it was a period that I most dreaded writing about. Why that was is that my research approach was to uh, dig into finding the, the principal characters in the reporting, talk to them about the behind the scenes tales of their famous work, and lots of people already knew about the Pentagon Papers. I think every editor at the New York Times wrote a book about the Pentagon Papers. Um, and uh, let's say I think there was something about Watergate too. Um, so I, was really, I really felt challenged. Um, but as I dug into those stories, I was surprised at what great material I was able to come up with. A lot of it was that I kind of got out of my old routine of trying to find out you know, what, what all had been written about cases like the Ponzi case. I took a different approach, and it was to get up close and personal. Um, to do my story on the Pentagon Papers, I found one of the original Pentagon Papers reporter reporters, a fellow named Fox Butterfield, who interestingly lived in my town of Hingham, Massachusetts. You know, what are the odds of that? There were only a handful of reporters working on that. But, so I found Fox and was able to sit down with him and find out what it was like from his standpoint of being a young reporter pressed into that story, the Pentagon Papers. They worked in a, in a, a hidden location in a Hilton in in New York to keep the whole, it was a secret reporting about the secret of papers. And these were the papers that Neil Sheehan, who uh, we just uh, heard talk at uh, one of these opening Pulitzer ceremonies in, in Washington. It was great to, to meet him for, for the first time. And um, he and Fox Butterfield and a number of other uh, reporters got together and, and did this work. As far as Watergate, rather than retelling all the president's men all over again, um, I found, to my joy, that Bob Woodward and Ben Bradley uh, were more than happy to sit down and talk about uh, the story in 
answering different kinds of questions uh, than they'd ever been asked before. Um, it's best explained, perhaps, I think, by just reading you. I'm not going to read you much from the book. You know, some people think that these things are book readings, and they're not. But um, I just want to read the way I started the, uh, the chapter, which I call All the Editor's Men. Bob Woodward had not seen the movie All the President's Men for 25 years. Then one day in mid-2005, he sat down with his eight-year-old daughter, Diana, while she watched it for the first time. Noticing her squirming a bit, Woodward asked what she was thinking. The guy pretending to, to be you doesn't look like you at all, <laughs> Diana told him. That, of course, would be Robert Redford. And what else? Boring. Boring, boring, she said. And she's exactly right, Woodward agrees, chuckling. Not just about the movie, but about the nature of the Watergate investigation itself. Because it's about fitting little pieces together. You don't know what you have when you first publish a little piece, but you publish it anyway. The rest of the chapter was for me, it was just as much fun because it led me to kind of recreate that whole story, not looking at, at it you know, from the standpoint of the, the story that helped drive Richard Nixon out of office, but the story of a little piece of information that grew and grew and grew through the work of those reporters. As I hope you're able to tell by now, I fell in love with a lot of these Pulitzer winning stories and got pretty close to the reporters whose work, uh, which really was their stories of a lifetime, the same way those stories had been for my dad, the stories of a lifetime. Um, I really got to know what those stories meant to them. And it, it, uh, I really feel honored to be able to retell those stories, some of which had been kind of lost in time. Another great reporter is Gil Gall, whose picture is up there. He won the Pulitzer in 1990 for the Philadelphia Inquirer. That paper had become a real uh, investigative uh, leading paper and uh, a Pulitzer machine, really, under an editor named Gene Roberts. Um, and uh, uh, Gene Roberts is, is still with us, and I was able to talk to him about uh, how he turned the Inquirer into such a great paper. It's one of my favorite stories, but I'll skip over that now. Um, Gill was assigned to write medical stories for the business section. He was a young reporter, and they put him on a beat called uh, Medical Business, which was kind of unusual in, uh, in 1990. And he was hunting for things to write about, and um, one day he was giving blood at an office blood drive, and it occurred to him that really, he really didn't know anything about what happened to a unit of blood after it came out of his arm as he was watching it flow out the tube. And he thought, you know, maybe there'd be a good story in finding out a little bit about what happens to that blood. And he told his editor, and the editor said, yeah, it sounds like a good story. I don't know either. I, I give blood, but I don't know anything about it. So Gil had, uh, you know, had his mission and said, so well, how am I going to find out about this? Um, you, know, you could probably intuitively think what he'd do. He went to the local Red Cross, Cross office and talked to the administrator there. And he said, so this is the story I'm going to do. Um, I really don't know what happens after uh, the blood comes out of my arm. I know it saves lives, but, and that there's something like a blood bank and things like this. Um, but uh, what, uh, what, what the basic questions, you know, things like uh, what do you do with the blood and uh, how much does a unit of, of blood cost? The official uh, heard the question and he answered, why are you asking that? We don't have to tell you anything. Now, to an investigative reporter, I remember Gill when he was telling me this story, kind of going, his, his antenna, why in the world would this guy be so, um, sorry, uh, why, would, uh, why would this guy be so evasive? And what he found was that there was this huge black market, I guess you could sort of call it a red market, um, in, in blood that the Red Cross at that time was making most of its money not by soliciting uh, funds from us good folks when there are disasters around the world, but they were making their money by selling blood and reselling it, and if the price went down, they would hold it back the same way like diamond uh, companies 
uh, would hold, will hold back di diamonds to bring the price up. It was really scandalous, but no one knew about it because it was unregulated. And uh, so Gilgal began to write about this, and uh, it, it began to get, uh, get, the publicity really began to get people interested in looking at that, that the whole situation has, has greatly changed. At the same time he was writing, the AIDS epidemic began to be um, publicized. And people learned more about that and, and, and clearly remember from that time that uh, the tainted blood was a huge, huge concern. And so um, it became just a, a national s a story of, of great import and uh, resulted in his winning the, the Public Service Pulitzer Prize in 1990. We don't have to tell you that. So that brings us to the summer day in July 2001, July 30th to be exact, when Marty Baron showed up in the Boston Globe newsroom for his first day as editor. And the idea of investigating sec sexual abuse among uh, priests of young Catholics was planted. So what is the slide of the New York Times doing up there? As you may recall from the movie, those who saw it, or from the actual events now 13 years ago, the spotlight team's diligent work on the church investigation was interrupted by another story, as often happens in the news business. Um, two of the most exciting areas of research for my book were, in fact, digging into the backstory of this one. So let's set the globe aside for a minute. I'll come back to it. The globe set their story aside. I remember one of the reporters was assigned to go down to Florida to look at the flight schools that some of the terrorists had attended and the flight school people were saying, yeah, that was really peculiar. They came here to learn how to fly, but nobody was interested in landing. <laughs> anyway, um, the, uh, this was amazing research. Uh, for me to go down to I worked for the Wall Street Journal for 23 years, so the New York Times was this great mystery. It was the, the brand X, we called it. And I didn't know about how the New York Times operated, but when I went to the New York Times and began to talk to editors, it was a stunning thing. I was in Boston at the time, and as you recall, two of the planes that flew into the Twin Towers came from Boston, so it was definitely, it was a Boston, had a Boston angle to it as well. Also my wife, who's sitting in the back here, Eileen was in New York at the time, so I was tied to the phone through all of this and tied to the TV, obviously, like all the rest of us. But when I went down to, to research this and talk to the editors and the reporters at the New York Times, I was amazed. They had to go back and recreate it in their own minds. It's like no one had really asked them, what was it like? How did your coverage evolve? They won the Pulitzer Prize, but no one had ever really detailed what that backstory was like. Um, I'll just take a moment to remind you of, of that winning work because of, of, of one element of it. What they got the prize for was creating this section called A Nation Challenged. And it was designed as a way to have a page that would be a new presentation of all of these stories. Obviously local stories because of what happened downtown national stories, clearly global stories, with wars breaking out. Uh, and um, so they had to have different ways to present it. They couldn't just use those eight columns the way, uh, the way they were at the time. They created this whole new way of presenting it. And I don't know if any of you remember what happened with the New York Times then, but they actually were limited. They're, they couldn't have more than four sections. So they needed a new front section, and they didn't have one. Does anybody remember that? they actually put a second full page on the back of another section, and you it was like the business section. You would turn it over, and they created a new front page out of the back of the other section. And this was the brainchild of one of the editors looking for a way to get more space to create this nation challenged. It was amazing. And you know, finding out all of this was just, to me, was fascinating as a news person learning about how the the, the, the news business um, uh, deals with issues, with problems. Um, so they created the, the Nation Challenged as a special section. 
And as you may recall, there was a facet of that called Portraits of Grief. Um, actually one of the most memorable, I think, of the things they did, examining in short snippets the lives of hundreds of victims of terrorist attack, thousands, including, of course, the first responders and those who had been trapped in the Twin Towers. Um, another surprising lesson for me as a researcher was, was how little uh, the reporters who came up with this uh, uh, portraits of grief remembered. They had to go back and review that as well. Um, an editor named Christine K, K-A-Y, was tasked with coming up with a plan for covering victims, like the first couple of days. New York Times editors, they have to parcel out these jobs. So picture this for a minute. She's got to come back with a way to treat victims in a daily newspaper in New York, um, when in fact you didn't know who was killed. Some of the first responders you might know, but by and large, for days and days and days, weeks actually, people were just missing. Um, she didn't know what to do, and she had her editors breathing down her neck about a way to get this covered. Um, what she did was truly amazing. Um, she based her idea uh, on what she observed going down in the lower Manhattan, noticing flyers, very sad, uh, flyers floating in the breeze. Have you seen this man? This is my husband. Uh, have you seen this woman? Uh, you know, this is my niece. Um, a little bit of a description where they might have been at that time. They worked in the 108th floor of the, one of the, the South Tower, something like that. And when she saw that, the idea hit her that maybe they should do something almost like that. Portraits of grief was devised. They couldn't call them obituaries. They didn't know who was dead. They, I mean, they figured probably these people were deceased. But um, that was what led to this, the idea of kind of like putting these flyers together. Um, I thought that was fascinating. And also, it's the kind of thing that newspapers it may not be the Twin Towers, but newspapers everywhere have to come up with some kind of a way to treat a tragedy. And uh, that's the way they did it. So for the 2003 Pulitzer, I think I'll just recommend that everybody see Spotlight. <laughs> that would be a start. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, of course. But if you have seen it, you might see it again. I think I'm going to buy a copy. Um, but I will tell you that there is a lot more to the backstory. Uh, than was in the movie. And uh, there's an awful lot of it um, in my book, which, you know, as I mentioned, came out first. Marty Baron, Walter Robinson, Mike Resendez, Sasha Pfeiffer, Matt Carroll, and Ben Bradley, those the, the, the two top editors of that project, Marty Baron and Ben Bradley, and the four reporters, um, they were gracious enough to tell me their memories early on. Uh, you know, they knew that I'd been reading their stories when they came out. And um, I got a lot more detail about it from them, a lot more than was in the movie. Um, and remember, for those of you who saw the movie, that the movie ends with the first story. And the Pulitzer Prize was won on the basis of that story and as many as 600 stories later in that year. The first story was January 6, 2002. So there's a lot more to tell. I mean, if, if, the, if, if you're not totally sick of it from <laughs> seeing the movie, uh, you might be interested in, in finding out uh, more from the book. Um, there are, were four other Spotlight reporters who are not mentioned uh, in, in, in the movie, or at least not mentioned as being spotlight reporters, Stephen Kirkshen, Kevin Cullen, Mike Paulson, and Tom Farragher. And they're all up there in that picture. I won't mention them all. Ro uh, Robbie Robinson is the one in the striped shirt. That's Ben Bradley. I will mention them all. Mike Paulson, Kevin Cullen, Mike Resendiz, Tom Farragher, Sasha Pfeiffer, only woman on the team, um, Matt Carroll, Marty Baron and Steve Kirkshen on the far right. And they all deserve credit, not just the first four that are in the movie. Um, but again, to, to give you an idea, another thing that isn't in the movie, the quality of the writing that went into this. I mean, when you put together a team like this that's so sensitive to getting this story out right and in a way that, uh, that doesn't offend, I mean, it's obviously going to be offensive, but 
um, but in a way that where people can really understand what's happening. Um, the writing is very important, and I just want to read one, one small passage from, uh, from a story by Robbie Robinson. Like other victims of pedophile priests, Tom remembers vividly what happened just after he was molested in a dark corridor at Immaculate Conception School in Revere by the Reverend James R. Porter. It was 1960. He was 12, but he still recalls running. He ran and then he hid under a desk in a second floor classroom, frozen in terror as Porter called out for him. And then he ran again out of the school and home. Chris was victimized about 12 years ago. He remembers struggling as Reverend John J. Gagan groped him in the rectory at St. Julia's in Weston before he squirmed out of Gagan's grasp. As Gagan yelled at him, no one will ever believe you, Chris ran from the, door, from the room. He ran from the rectory. He ran behind the church and cowered there until his father came for him. Gagan was right. Chris never said a word. Now, Chris and Tom, Tom and Chris have stopped running. Thomas R. Fulcino, the father, and Christopher T. Fulcino, the son, are victims of Massachusetts' two most notorious priest pedophiles, three decades apart, for their family lightning struck, struck twice. Movies are great, guys, <laughs> but there's still some things that writing can do much better. The Spotlight team, of course, is still at it, and more importantly, other publications are considering adding them. And I think Spotlight may encourage even more publications to do that. There's a, a philosophy in journalism now that, that the value proposition is important to people, and that instead of just making sure everybody's name is in the paper, uh, that if, you're, if you care enough to buy a, a paper, you should be delivered something of that kind of quality. It takes, it's expensive. It takes teams of reporters to do. I have to wrap up <laughs> um, very quickly by, by mentioning a, a couple more stories, uh, and then we'll, we'll be done. Um, the Walter Reed stories, I mentioned here, uh, Walter Reed Medical Center in, in Washington, in, in Bethesda, Maryland, was uh, a very important story that the Washington Post did. Um, again, I think it's the public service was disclosing how absolutely absurd that was that, that um, wounded veterans would come back from Iraq and Afghanistan and find themselves in medical facilities that were totally run down. Even the government didn't know what was going on behind those walls. And it took reporters going in there, kind of a, almost like an undercover operation. You have to be very careful with those kinds of stories. But when they reported those stories, the Secretary of Defense and President Bush immediately began to investigate and take, took corrective action without the Washington Post um, Dan, a priest on the left, and Hole in the metal, and, and some guy who was asking him questions on the right. That's at, <laughs> at the museum. Um, another, another story uh, a couple of years after that, and I just love Alexandra Berzon's stories for the, Los Ange for the Las Vegas Sun for a number of reasons. First, with the worrisome state of American journalism today, her work explains why I'm still encouraged about prospects for the future. Alexandra had just graduated from college in 2007, UC Berkeley, when she was hired by The Sun, a Las Vegas Sun, which appeared as an insert in the Las Vegas Review Journal. And she was given the assignment by editors to try and find out why so many workers were dying in construction projects on the Las Vegas Strip. Editors couldn't, couldn't figure it out and nobody quite knew. While they were the accidents clearly were awful. The deaths had, been, had all been described by the powers that be, the casino companies, city regulators, and even the union officials as being just unfortunate but ultimately unavoidable accidents reflecting how dangerous the nature of that job is. Well, Ali, Alexandria didn't believe that. Uh, she not only detailed the, the human stories behind the statistics, but she examined each accident to show how lax regulation in the construction industry and the casinos doing 
the building, was behind the deaths. Uh, casinos had fought against government controls while union officials had not taken the side of their workers and neither had the city and state. The first thing she did was to compare the, the, the statistics for Las Vegas with other cities, which just clearly illustrated that with all the building going in in New York, they didn't have the rates of death and industry uh, that they were having in Las Vegas. Uh, and that kind of led her to explore more about things like you know, safety nets that didn't exist and uh, the lack of inspection. Um, it, it really turned everything around. I just have to say this, I, another reason I love this is it's a picture. She's one of those rare cases of someone who had no idea that her newspaper was up for a Pulitzer Prize. Nowadays, you sort of know, you know, the Boston Globe certainly knew that they were gonna win. But Allie came back from covering a meeting and walked in and, you know, surprise, you've won the Pulitzer Prize. And this is a picture of her calling her mom. <laughs> I won the Pulitzer Prize. So uh, one, one last, I'll skip the very last case, but this is a, the case of the, uh, uh, the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale, more people celebrating. Um, uh, Sally Keston is the one with her arms raised. John Maine is the reporter on the left-hand side. And their story, too, encourages me about how, even under pressure of financial problems affecting news organizations, inventive reporters and editors can prove that things are can prove things that are seemingly unprovable. The two reporters uh, became fascinated with evidence that South Florida police were recklessly speeding and that terrible accidents and deaths had resulted from that recklessness. What had piqued their interest had been one of those viral videos that you see on, all the time. It was uh, a dashboard video of a state highway patrol officer pulling over a speeding local cop at gunpoint. And it turned out that the cop had been off duty driving to a second job at 120 miles an hour. And the state patrol woman uh, you know, knew that this was a dangerous situation and also knew that he was off duty. So Sally and John wanted to prove that, but you know, they knew it was dangerous, but they weren't sure how to illustrate. I mean, you have to have the evidence to show the speeds and, and that the person's off duty and all that. So, the first thing they did was they, they bought a radar gun and they went to an overpass. Uh, this is the first part of my first chapter of my book, by the way. Um, they went to an overpass and at a time of a shift change, they began to focus it on the cars coming down to see if they could get police cars to see how fast they were going. And it worked pretty well until it started raining and <laughs> Then they realized too that you know with the headlights coming at the shift change, they couldn't tell which was a cop car and which wasn't, and it was pretty disastrous. Um, so it took a whole new strategy, and that strategy was that they um, uh, they were able to get the records of transponders in the cars when they went through toll gates, and they were able to calculate how fast the car had to be going for the transponder to click at one toll gate and then click at another. And using the computers, they could document the speeds of these cars and prove from the time that the people were off duty. It was brilliant. And the Pulitzer board absolutely loved that because it showed that a paper, and the, the parent company was in bankruptcy, by the way, at the time, that, but that purely by those reporters um, doing that kind of work uh, that, that they could make a real difference. Um, I'm going to skip over last year's winner, which is the Charleston Post and Courier, uh, just because we're out of time. But if anybody wants to, wants to hear about that you know, later, I can tell them about it. But the, the most recent winner is fascinating because uh, this team that did uh, research into why so many women in, in South Carolina were killed, they, they were able to calculate that one woman in South Carolina is killed by her significant other every 12 days. And their research illustrated what the story was behind all of that. Uh, fascinating story. And the, the, the reason I can, I can still kind of end with this is that this team of reporters has continued to work together. Charleston has become a real hotbed of news. You know, They also had that Walter Scott case of the guy who was shot in, in the back while running away from a, a policeman, the, uh, the uh, black suspect. 
And then they also had, uh, just more recently, last year, the, uh, the massacre in the black church in mm -hmm. Charleston. And this team of reporters was on that story too. I would not be at all surprised if they don't find themselves winning a breaking news Pulitzer this year. So, you know, my optimism uh, about the business is not because things are going well in, in finances of journalism, but because these young journalists really do appreciate the job that they have and that uh, newspapers are gradually seeing that, that, they, that they can put these uh, individuals on these kind of big stories and a story like Spotlight really does inspire news organizations to, to do this. So we'll see what happens on April 18th, but um, uh, I think it's important for all of us as news consumers to, to be aware of the pressures on the business and also be aware of what is possible at the very highest level for journalism. So that's my hope that, that this book and this talk tonight will give you an idea that journalists really want to do this kind of work. And when they get involved in it, uh, the whole nature of being in a newsroom changes. And uh, it is a fascinating thing. I was at the Burlington Free Press <laughs> uh, today and talked to the staff. And I was just excited to hear them get all involved in it. And as I was telling them, you know, it's a big job to cover an election like they were doing yesterday. Um, very different from having a story like, you know, the murder of, of South Carolina women. But it is a case where you're called together to work as a team to try and present a cogent story to your readers. And it was great to see all these people be inspired by that and ask me questions about it. So um, I'm hopeful that, that we'll have a lot more of that in the future. Um, so I'll wrap up now. I could go on a hundred years worth. But, uh, but I'd really love to hear any questions you have or concerns that you have. Yes, sir. It's funny, you mentioned the Burlington Free Press because it's done by USA Today, which is just the antithesis of, of a Pulitzer Prize winner. You can well, get enough out of USA Today to fill up a trash can. Gannett, <laughs> Gannett which owns USA Today, uh, has a soul. And I will tell you that I have noticed that they've been hiring a couple of people that I really know and like. I, I think there may be something going on there. When I was saying that about that idea that the value proposition is something that more and more publishers are recognizing, there are some newspapers that had really been going down the slippery slope that have changed in recent years. One of them is the Philadelphia Inquirer, which really had some bad times and was, uh, and was going bankrupt. A lot of these um, non, uh, these online operations that are helping newspapers now. Uh, you've heard of ProPublica and um, uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting and investigative reporters and editors that, that do trainings. Um, th their work is beginning to be noticed by the traditional news organizations. And so I think there's a possibility that we'll, that we'll see a swing that way. And I like to think that maybe Spotlight and average readers demanding that that kind of work be done rather than abandoned because it is expensive um, might make a difference. Yes, ma'am. Did you notice in your research whether there was a pattern as to whether the Pulitzers were going to young new reporters or veteran reporters, or do you think it was evenly spread over the hundred years? Oh, that's great. It's, it's, it's very uneven, but it's uneven in a funny way. Um, a lot of Pulitzers go to the seasoned veterans who really know how to get a great story. I mean, there's, there's, there's really nothing that can, uh, uh, that can equal that kind of experience in the newsroom. I mean, working for the Wall Street Journal, I learned at the feet of these great old time reporters who knew what to do. That's how I learned what to do. In the Public Service Award, it's almost all team journalism. So you have this combination of the very young, like Ali Berzon, and the grizzled editors who've been through it all the time and who value that, uh, that ability of the young people to, to do the work, all sorts of elements. When I talked to, to Woodward, he was reminding me that one of the reasons those two young reporters, they were both, uh, he was a rookie reporter and, and Carl Bernstein was, uh, had only been there for two or three years. Um, the, uh, the reason they, were, they got that story was they were the young guys in the office on a Saturday that the the season reporters didn't want to work the weekends. Mm -hmm. So they got assigned to that story and then nobody could take it away from them once they got started. But it too became a huge team project. But what I found 
was fascinating to me about the, the Pulitzer board is that they love these, they love these stories of, uh, of young reporters who, who break a big story. Uh, I have a chapter in my book called, the new edition of the book that uh, wasn't in when it first came out, called Prizing Youth. And it's about two consecutive years where young reporters under 30, one of them was Allie, and the other was a fellow named Daniel Gilbert, um, in Bristol, Virginia, a little tiny town, um, a small paper that Warren Buffett has since bought. But um, they won, uh, I think in large part because the board saw that these young reporters doing this great work and using their computer skills to make all of this come together, um, uh, the odds of them winning was, was so small that when the, the board had the evidence that they'd done this story, I think they gave them a little extra weight. Uh, so young reporters do have a very good chance and small newspapers and news organizations have a very good chance to win an award. But you'll never, uh, you know, you'll never find that reporters like New York Times chief investigative reporter David Barstow, he's gonna be winning every few years because he really knows what he's doing and they give him the, the time uh, and the resources to get that big story. Yes, sir, in the back. I find it very offensive that the free press that's so important to democracy is being attacked by Donald Trump and other people that, that call the press scum. They do such an important service to keep us as a free people. What are your feelings about that? Well, I first of all wonder why everybody cheers when he says it. Mm. I mean, he's playing to the crowd. Uh, I mean, that's, that's not an attack on a candidate. The candidates play to the crowd. Um, more, I mean, my initial concern as a journalist is when he calls down the crowd on a, an individual reporter or photographer, um, endangering that person's life. That photographer is there doing a job. Um, but, you know, criticizing the press is absolutely nothing new. Remember in Watergate uh, uh, that, uh, that Richard Nixon and his, um, uh, his press secretary came out and accused the Washington Post of, of shabby, shoddy journalism. When I talked to Woodward, I mean, he remembered what that was like as a young reporter. He was terrified. The president of the United States and his agents were accusing them of lying. And they knew they were just trying to get the facts and, and get the story. Um, you know, it's, it's a shocking thing, but people need to react to that. I mean, I would like it if there was dead silence when any politician says that about the press. Um, the press certainly has horrific problems and a lot of problems in covering, uh, covering elections. But uh, we shouldn't view that as, as something new. I think what's really, to me, what's new is the cheering throngs. And uh, politicians are gonna play to that. It's, it's off-putting. Um, but it's a symbol of, of, I think, what we've seen in this election year. It's impossible to be a free people without a free press. <laughs> Which is the, the, the basis of the Pulitzer Prize is being, being started on that. You know, that there's an amendment besides the Second Amendment. Um, and uh, and they, they stand side by side. <laughs> Um, but uh, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, the First Amendment uh, is, a, is a right we need to protect. And, uh, you know, luckily we have a two-party system. <laughs> so, you know, the debate will come out. And, and I think there are some candidates on, uh, certainly there are candidates on the Republican side who are offended by uh, those remarks about the press as well. Uh, Go, absolutely go after the press when, it, when it's off base. You know, I'm all for it, I do that myself. But um, it, it's scary when there are people out in the audience who, are, who become targets. Yes, sir. How do you compare yourself with TV as a reporter? Uh, Fred Allen, <laughs> personally myself, I would say, what Fred Allen said, remember his great line, he says, I have a great face for radio. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, um, I'm, I'm sure you're talking about uh, TV news. Uh, t historically, TV news has really been based on what's in print. I mean, that's what we all remember. Walter Cronkite would be nothing without the papers that his reporters and that he read that day 
to, right. to be able to present in, on television. Um, things have changed so much that in, in both the newspapers and in, in TV that it's really become a, uh, uh, a battle of opinions and instant reaction, instant analysis. You know, I read an article not too long ago that really uh, brought me back learning a little bit of history. Remember when there was a fairness doctrine? When you couldn't put anything on TV without presenting the other side? Yeah. Well, that went away. That's, that's what I was referring to, actually, because uh, there's a consolidation of newspapers, too, and news reports, yes. uh, news centers, and we, we know them very well. And uh, it just seems to me that the uh, basic newspaper reporting has to be very clean. And uh, because the, when you listen to TV, you have a lot of editorializing that you're listening to and a great deal and, and hunches of people there that are quite yeah. different than what you do when you go out to get a story, it seems to me. Yeah, no, it, it, it is very different, and then you, but you have the Charlie Roses of the world, too, that you listen to. Oh, Charlie. What a great, yeah, I never thought of it that way, and really respectful of the people he's interviewing, yeah. and um, feel the same way about Bill Moyers, by the way, who's an old, actually he was involved with Newsday at a time when they were winning uh, Pulitzer Prizes. But um, uh, I wish I could. Uh, you know, in the elections this year, what we're going through, if somebody, if, if newspapers had just put up a chart each day and said what was truth and what's oh, that kind of thing. Okay. Well, you know, and, that, and I never saw anybody really do that. You, you know what I'm, what I'm, what I'm going to say about that now is that there are really there are a couple of things I'll say. There are some fascinating cases. We probably know about these organizations like PolitiFact, which yeah. is run by the Tampa Bay mm -hmm. Times, yeah. and uh, there are fact-checking organizations. Uh, Washington Post is doing it as well. Uh, one of my favorite sites is Snopes for, for looking at you know, different claims I see on the internet. Um, what's happening though is that even when these people get you know, four Pinocchios or whatever the award is, or uh, Pants on Fire was my favorite about the yeah. death panels. That was, Pants on Fire was, for, that was uh, Miss Palin, Palin and the death panels. But um, uh, those things are, make great reading. But, what is, what is of even more concern to me, I, equal concern, I should say, is American youth doesn't know where to turn for that kind of thing with the information they're getting on their cell phone. And there are, there are the beginnings of, of uh, I won't say uh, healing for that, but, but there are some solutions. There's an organization that's really growing uh, now called uh, the News Literacy Program. I've written a few things for them. And they go into high schools and they talk to young people about how to judge what they see as news or reports that they, that they get. And it uses a lot of the same techniques that reporters have learned for years and years and years to be able to tell the truth from an untruth. And um, it's fascinating to see uh, how those kids react to that. A lot of them have just never been given those basic uh, tenets of, of um, how to measure what they see. They assume, what was it Will Rogers always said, you know, uh, everything, anything I read in the paper, you know. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that, I, that there, there is some hope there, but, uh, but definitely learn to check those uh, uh, those um, fact-checking organizations, because there are a lot of them out there, and they do a good uh, job. I'm, I will be looking, because I haven't found them yet. So it might start with PolitiFact. It won a Pulitzer Prize, actually, yeah. uh, several yeah. years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you were talking about truth in news, and you know, you hear about these created stories, uh, and I'm wondering, have any of the public service Pulitzers ever been uh, revoked because the, the news was not truly the news, it was fiction? It wasn't fact. None, was none revoked. There, there, there are Pulitzers that have been withdrawn. The famous case from the 80s was the case of Janet Cook at the Washington Post, who, who wrote feature stories about um, uh, drug-addicted children. Yeah. Um, and it turned out that 
they discovered that she'd made them up. Actually, her editor was Bob Woodward, who's always tried to live this down. And the, the post, uh, she was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. The stories were very dramatic. Uh, Jimmy's World, they were called. And uh, the post uh, gave the prize back. And uh, yeah, and um, there, there are a couple of other cases. There are a couple of Pulitzer Prizes, public service Pulitzer Prizes that are kind of surprising. In 1990, uh, at ni sorry, 1919, the end of World War I, uh, for the work done in 1918 when World War I was still going on, the Milwaukee Journal won a public service prize for the way it um, editorialized about how people in Wisconsin were really not pro-German. A lot of the Germanic people in, in Wisconsin were very sensitive about that. And they launched this big campaign. And one of the things they said was that we need to stop teaching German in schools because we were at war. Does that sound like anybody else you know? Yeah. But um, until we know more, let's stop teaching German. Yeah. Um, but it was fascinating to me to find that out because I, you know, that kind of thing might not fly today, I don't think, I hope. Mm -hmm. But um, no, public service Pulitzer Prize has been pretty pure uh, over the years. <laughs> um, any other questions? Because I know we're, I was talking a little bit more than I should have. Um, I want to, uh, I, I do want to thank, uh, uh, you know, I'll thank the same sponsors that, that you mentioned before, but I'm really I'm, uh, appreciative of Phoenix Books coming out here with my, my books because it's, it's great to know that, uh, uh, that the book is available. <laughs> I was very glad that it, it came out this year and there really there are no new books for the, uh, um, for the centennial of the Pulitzer. So I'd like to think that this is a little bit of a memento. And I tried to make this a book that's really readable. Uh, I want it to be something that journalists and non-journalists alike can, uh, can learn from. So I'm glad they're here. And if, uh, if anybody wants to get a book, I'm happy to inscribe it personally. If you've got somebody in journalism school, I'll make it out to you. Um, but that's really basically uh, it. And um, I'm really, really happy that you, know, that you came out tonight because I do love talking about this. I'm uh, uh, a big fan of public service journalism and I, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm all for a strong future for it. So it, it helps me to know that there's somebody besides those people cheering on the candidates who say, oh, the press, they're liars. They're, you know, they're bigger liars. Um, it's nice to know there's a group here that that wants to hear a little bit about what the, what the business is capable of, because there are a lot of reporters out there who want to give you what you need to get by in life. Thank you.